So, before we begin, uh, I always want to kind of set the tone for what we're talking about when we talk about myth. Because uh, the popular usage of the word myth is something that is untrue. Uh, and, and we have to go about busting these myths. Is that still a show? So, Mythbusters? Uh, that's fine. Religious studies scholars, uh, anthropologists, etc., do not see myth that way. Quite the opposite, in fact. We see myth uh, as a story or a set of stories that is so deeply true, it's hard to get to. These are the stories that form us. And it's like a fish trying to examine water. Right? So we're so involved in myth, we need myth to understand myth. And so that's what I mean by myth when I refer to myth here. I'll never be referring to uh, the myth that needs to be busted. If anything, myths burst us. They burst our egos right, by the telling of the story and by our embodiment in that story. So myths kind of read us more than we read myths. And that is, I think, and many other scholars do, how we make meaning. We make meaning through story. We like to think we make meaning through rationality, but we really suck at rationality. We're really bad at it because we're animals and we have this limbic brain and, and even with the frontal, prefrontal cortex and all that, we, we just never escape that limbic brain. Um, but what we can do is tell stories. Stories are maps that orient us in the world. They're not perfect maps. They're fluid. They're constantly changing because the world's constantly changing and because you're constantly changing. And so anytime you try to freeze a story, you're going to kill it because the world and you are constantly moving. And so it's an interesting map that's always animated, isn't it? Well, that's what myth is. But that doesn't mean you can't derive meaning from it. Quite the opposite. In fact, that's really the only way to derive meaning in such a world with so many moving parts, including you. So what we're going to see here in examining these myths is something that's going to be foreign to most of us. And that is this consonance, this harmony, as above, so below, so that the world above is reflected in the world here that we live and is reflected perhaps in another world below, who knows, but there's this consonance, there's this harmony between worlds. That's very alien to most of us because we live in a fractured world, a world that's broken uh, between good and bad, light and dark, male and female, uh, and other. Uh, we live, and so we're always, we always feel like we have to choose sides. Um, this was not the case for the people who told and lived these stories. They weren't living in a fractured world. Well, most of them. You'll see when the fracture comes. You can probably guess when the fracture occurs. For most of them, this was a seamless reality. So for example, uh, last summer we did a little bit on the Papal Vu, the great Mayan text, that reads to us like a series of stories. And it is a series of stories. And they're bizarre and wonderful. But it's also an almanac. It's, a, it's an instruction on how and when to plant corn. And it's also an astronomical chart. Because the stories are lived out in the sky for the ancient Mayans and the contemporary Mayans. The stories are lived out. This is not a question of, is this real? It's right there. I see it every season when the Pleiades go below the horizon. So I want you to kind of use your imagination to get into this world where myth isn't set against truth. Myth is just all there is. Story is all there is. And the worlds are different, but they resonate together. Right? And so there's this really interesting um, connection that we may not be used to. Now, as a scholar, uh, I'm very concerned, and people, uh, all scholars are very concerned, that we don't replicate some of the mistakes of the past which, when we study myth, which is to kind of flatten everything for the sake of uniformity. 
or universality, even worse. Every time I hear the term, you know, well, that's a universal thing, I think of the um, Native American writer Sherman Alexie, who says, if a white person says it uni it's universal, it just means he understands it. <laughs> right? So uh, I don't know what is universal. I, I don't know what value a universal thing would have, except to flatten everything into one story. So, I, I don't want to talk about universality. I want to talk about commonality. Because commonality is, it recognizes the similarities without flattening or eliminating the differences. Joseph Campbell called these universal, actually Bastian before him, called these universal notions versus ethnic ideas. So we don't want to ignore the culture from which these stories arise. That would be bad, because these stories are tied to the landscapes uh, of those cultures. Uh, if you want to see what happens to a story that gets surgically removed from its landscape and passed around, look at the Bible, right? Because it's grounded in ancient Palestine and Israel and when you try to make it work in Tennessee, you're going to have some problems. Right? I'm from Tennessee. That's why I can say Tennessee, uh, because I've seen it. <laughs> try, to be, try to be forced into that culture. So the way out of that is quite simple. You understand the culture from which it arises as best you can. Right? And then you're very wary of applying it to your own without that understanding. At the same time, it would be a loss if we didn't look for the similarities, right? If we didn't look for some common humanity in these cultures. I just don't want us to go too far that way and start talking about universal ideas and, and all religions teach this. No, they don't. They teach vastly different things. But yeah, maybe behind that, there's some similarities and that's what I want us to get to. Related to that is the past versus present issue, which I think is pretty clear. Um, and you'll see this played out tonight in the story of ISIS. How does this story of ancient Egypt function in, in contemporary culture? I'm going to show you. Uh, not without some difficulty, but it can. And then, of course, I think you know this, too. These stories are multivalent. Uh, if you go looking at a myth, if you go looking for one meaning, you're going to be frustrated. I know we live in a postmodern culture, and, and that means you know, multivalency and irony and all that, but that's also the way most people have lived on the planet, it is not with this one story, but with many stories that conflict and cohere and change over time due to necessity, due to landscape changes, due to political changes. It, myth is protean. It, it's like that monster in the Odyssey. You, know, you try to grab it, and it changes shape. Myth is like that. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't wrestle with myth. And we're going to do that tonight. One more kind of preface-like thing. I want to give you three metaphors to think about in terms of myth. I want you to think of myth as I, E-Y-E. I want you to think of myth as that instrument of perception. It allows you to see things that you wouldn't otherwise have seen. Tonight's a great example. You're going to see some things in the story of Isis and Osiris that are not otherwise revealed. And so myth is an I. Myth is a window. Once the eye sees this story, the eye sees the surface, the literal level, but you need to see through the story, right? Obviously, when Jesus says, I am the door, he's not a door, okay? I know there are people who would argue that. No, he's really a door. That's what he said. No, it's the realm of metaphor. That's the window function. We've got to see through the text, see through its literalness, its surface level. And then, of course... There is the mirror, because ultimately, what you see when you 
use the eye, the, the story, to see the world in you, and you look through that story, what you ultimately see is yourself looking back. And so then you have something to deal with. You have a question to answer, and that is, who are you? And where do you fit in? And then you're right back into, into the mythology, because the mythology is going to tell you all that. Cool. Let's go to Egypt. Let me give you some context here. The Isis and Osiris story is Egyptian. It's, uh, there's a nice little map. Uh, I don't know if you remember your Western Civ, but Upper Egypt is below, and Lower Egypt is above. See, we're already postmodern. <laughs> um, there's the famous Red Sea. That's probably not where the Israelites crossed. Probably was the Reed Sea, but we'll get into that maybe sometime. And you can see the pyramids up here and the Great Nile Delta. And the Nile, of course, I mean, you, you could not know anything about Egypt and already see the importance of that river to that culture. And, and some of the greatest civilizations we've ever had on this planet are river cultures, right? The Indus River, the Amazon River, the Mississippi River, even. Yeah. All right. So the stories we get from uh, about Isis and Osiris come from the pyramid text. And so this is, this is the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which isn't really a book. It's kind of these, mostly these pyramid texts, and, the, and so there's nothing that really holds them together other than they were written on the walls of the pyramids. And their purpose was to help the dead move through the underworld. So for pharaohs and other um, higher level people, it was pyramid texts. For most everyone else, it was coffin texts. So they were written on the insides of the coffin in stories. These prayers, too, some of which I'll, I'll read to you. The Isis and Osiris, Osiris story was, and I want you to remember this because it becomes an interesting feature later on, it was a popular story. So it was, it was some, a story that everyone would know. Uh, so it wasn't one of those secret stories. It wasn't a story that was just for the elite or just the priests. It was everybody's story, and you'll see why when I tell it to you, because it's about family, and it's about life after death. It's pretty basic stuff. So here is what's called the Aeneid, or the Nine of Egypt. This is the Godhead, uh, and the, it's kind of the theogony. Remember, we, we read the theogony a while back. So everything begins in water. What a surprise. There you go. There's something about that's common among the world's creations myths that isn't we don't have to call universal. But why does it always start with water? Well, there's, there could be some good reasons for that, because we start with water. Right? We start in an amniotic sac, or we, as a species, started from the ocean. Uh, whatever. So we have uh, these various gods here. And let me read you just about these gods here. So Atum, the sun god, is from Lower Egypt or was worshipped in Lower Egypt. Um, mostly about the setting sun. And you may know Re, who is mostly about the midday sun. So Atum is kind of ancient, more ancient, and, and less strong than Re. Um, Ray was centered in Heliopolis, uh, another major center. Later gets merged with uh, Amun into a deity, into a deity known as <coughs> Amun Ray. Excuse me. Uh, and then these gods get combined all the time, and you're going to see this with Isis too. How does a god get combined with another god? Well, it's because we make the gods. The gods are made in our image, and they have a certain function. And when we need them to serve a certain function, we can change them, because we made them. Um, Imam, uh, the hidden one. All right. Uh, Hathor, the mansion of Horus is what that means. Perhaps the first great mother goddess, and represented in, with the attributes of a cow. Uh, this is going to come back in the story. She was a goddess of love and joy. And perhaps, well, in some stories, the mother of Horus, 
um, sometimes a consort or a lover of Horus. And then there's Horus, which means the one who is above. We're going to hear a lot about Horus. Um, sky god with a falcon shape. And so, yes, Raina, we're soaring with the, like the falcon, Horus. Uh, he, and, and so all these gods, well, most of these gods are going to get bound up in the notion of kingship or ruling the kingdom. That's very important to have this divine imprimatur in order to rule. And so Horus becomes, as you'll see, kind of the first uh, more permanent ruler of Egypt, or at least parts of Egypt. Osiris means seat of the eye, uh, the place where the sun goes, associated with earth, uh, thought by some to represent some pre-dynastic king of Egypt. We can talk about this, whether these were real people who become apotheosisized, they become gods just through the telling. That's a Max Mueller notion is that he says mythology is a disease of language. Isn't that a great line? Mythology is, is a disease of language. So he says mythology is really just people telling ordinary stories about maybe extraordinary people and then over the course of time they become bigger and bigger until they become gods. Um, Anubis, a deity, that's a jackal or a jackal-headed human. You've probably see, seen him. Anyway, I wanted to read you um, the story, the theogony of these gods, because it's one of my favorite myths of all time. Sorry. <clears throat> I am the eternal spirit. I am the sun that rose from primeval waters. My soul is God. I am the creator of the word. Evil is my abomination, I see it not. I am the creator of the order wherein I live. Creator of the order wherein I live. Hmm. I am the word which will never be annihilated, in this my name of soul. Keep in mind, 2400 BCE. The word came into being. All things were mine when I was alone. I was Ray in all his manifestations. I was the great one who came into being of himself, who created all his names as the companies of the lesser gods, he who is irresistible among the gods. I fulfilled my desires when I was alone. Wait, what? I fulfilled my des all my desires when I was alone. This is taking a different turn. Before there had appeared a second to be with me in this place, I assumed form as that great soul wherein I started being creative while still in the primeval waters in a state of inertness. Before I found anywhere to stand, I considered in my heart, I planned in my head how I should make every shape. While this was while I was still alone. I planned in my heart how I should create other beings, the myriad forms of copri and that there should come into being their children and theirs. So it was I who spat forth Shu and expectorated Tefnut, so that when there had been one god, there were now three as myself. Spat forth? The word came into being. All things were mine when I was alone. Let me skip down a little bit. After an age, well, first of all, Notice that the thought is the generator. Thought is the generator. That's a fairly common uh, theme in mythology. In, for example, in Pueblo mythology, they have a creature called Thought Woman um, who thinks about things and they appear. So thought as generator. And that's related to language as generator. Because what good is a thought that isn't spoken, right? After an age, my eye brought them these to me, and they approached me and joined my body that they might issue from me. When I rubbed with my fist, my heart came into my mouth, in that I spat forth shoe and expect, oh, okay. Creation by masturbation. But as my, I'm not kidding, <laughs> but as my father was relaxed, uh, I wept tears in the form of my eye, and that is how mankind came into existence. I replaced it with the shining one, the sun, and it became enraged with me when it came back and found another glowing in its place. So 
I mentioned creation by masturbation, and there's an element of tears there, too, as a creative material, uh, because that makes so much sense. Isn't creation about semen? Uh, isn't creation about bodily fluids? It has to be, right? And so the ancients had no qualms about talking about sex, and you're going to see in the next slide, or depicting sex as a religious act. Everybody's waiting for the next slide, aren't you? All right. So as you can see, this is uh, Geb lying, the earth, uh, with his erect phallus and newt, the night, spread over him. Um, right. So the pyramid, this is a pyramid text. So when I said pyramid text, these are things that were written on the walls of the pyramid. Uh, it is a prayer. This is a prayer. Spoken first to Osiris and then to Newt, calling them to take the deceased king into their protection and assure him of everlasting life. The sarcophagus of the king represents the earth. So again, see, as above, so below. So the sarcophagus is the earth, or Geb, and the lid stands for the sky, Newt. Right? What must it be like to live in a culture where that's, there's that resonance? Right? Where I have the story of these two gods, and this story becomes alive at my funeral. And not just alive, but embodied in my own funeral, where I become these gods in my coffin and the lid of the coffin. The priest speaks the initial prayers to Osiris, while Geb speaks the rest of the passage to his sister consort, Newt. And here's the prayer. O Osiris the king, may you be protected. I give you all the gods, their heritages, their provisions, all their possessions, for you have not died. You'll see why they say this in the next slide. Osiris the king, appear as the king of upper and lower Egypt, because you have power over the gods in their spirits. O Newt, spread yourself over your son, Osiris, the king, that you may conceal him from Seth. Protect him, O Newt. Have you come that you may now conceal your son? I have indeed come that I may protect the great one. All right. So what is this story that's informing these pyramid texts and this mythology of ancient Egypt that involves um, Isis and Osiris? Uh, so, from Geb, the sky god, and Newt, the earth goddess, come the four children. Uh, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. All right? Osiris was the oldest, and so he became the king of Egypt, and he married his sister Isis. Osiris was a good king, commanded the respect of all those who lived on the earth and the gods who dwelled in the netherward, netherworld. However, Set was always jealous of Osiris. Again, this story gets repeated over and Oh, it's the Cain and Abel story, right? Except this is much older. Set was always jealous of Osiris because he did not command the respect of those on earth or those in the netherworld. Um, Osiris has a power that Set does not. One day Set transformed himself into a vicious monster and attacked Osiris, killing him. With Osiris dead, Set became the king of Egypt, with his sister Nephthys as his wife. She, however, felt sorry for her sister Isis, who wept endlessly over her lost husband. Isis, who had great magical powers, remember this, very important, decided to find her husband and bring him back to life long enough so that they could have a child. Together with Nephthys, Isis roamed the country, collecting the pieces of her husband's body and reassembling them. We have seen this before. Goddesses put things back together that are broken. It happens over and over again. It's common in world mythology. Once she completed this task, she breathed the breath of life into his body and resurrected him. They were together again, and Isis became pregnant soon after. Osiris was able to descend into the underworld and where he became lord of that domain. The child born of this union was named Horus, the hawk god. And when he became an adult, 
Horus decided to make a case before the court of the gods that it was he, not Set, who was the rightful king of Egypt. A long period of argument followed, and Set challenged Horus to a contest. The winner would become king. Set, however, did not play fair. Another common element, right? Especially with the younger brother. I don't know if they, you've had any experience with younger brothers. I am a younger brother, and I do not play fair. She snared him, but uh, Isis did, after she, he set a trap for Osiris, uh, for Horus, sorry. Uh, but Set begged for his life, and Isis let him go. When he found out that she had let his enemy live, Horus became angry with his mother, raged against her, earning him the contempt of the other gods because he, because he did not respect his mother. They decided there'd be one more match, and Set would get to choose what it would be. He chooses a boat race. However, in order to make the contest a challenge, Set decided that he and Horus would race boats made of stone. <laughs> awesome, right? Horus was tricky, ah, very important feature of the divine, uh, especially the divine son being tricky. We're going to see this uh, motif played out a lot in these stories of couples. And he built a boat made of wood and then covered it with limestone plaster, which looked like a stone. As the gods assembled for the race, Set cut off the top of a mountain to serve as his boat and set it in the water, as one does. His boat <laughs> sank right away, and all the other gods laugh at him. Angry, Set now transforms himself into a hippopotamus and attacks Horus's boat. Isn't this great? He becomes a hippopotamus. And remember, it's being told in Egypt, where they're there in the river. Um, the other gods decided that the match was a tie. Here's another thing. The other gods suck. They're, they just suck. Uh, you know, Zeus is lame and doesn't take time to decide anything equally. Just like, whatever. All right, you, you're nagging me more than anyone else, so I'll do what you say. The gods suck. They also don't know how to create humans. But we'll get into that. All this is coming. Horus fought off Set, uh, but the other gods stopped him and decided it was a tie. Many of the gods were sympathetic to Horus, but they remembered his anger toward his mother. Gentlemen, take note. The gods who formed the court <laughs> decided to write a letter to Osiris and asked for his, to Osiris for, and asked for his advice. Osiris responded with a definite answer. Guess what it was? My son is the rightful king. OK, good. Um, no one, said Osiris, should take the throne of Egypt through an act of murder, as Seth had done. OK, now we have an ethical dimension. Uh, that, well, we have an ethical dimension introduced here. You cannot accede to the throne through murder. Horus had not killed anyone and was the better candidate. The sun and the stars were his allies. He had descended into the underworld. And finally, the gods agreed that Horus should claim his birthright as the king of Egypt. Now, I want you to know that there, there are Egyptians accounts and then there are other accounts. So if you feel like something's missing from that story, you're right, because it doesn't come along until later. All right, so let me carry on here with Isis and Horus. Uh, by the way, we brought Isis and Horus out for you tonight. Thank you. Uh, as I told Kelly, she said, oh, let's move the Madonna. I said, that's not the Madonna. That's Isis and Horus. She's like, I'm sorry I was raised Catholic. Uh, but yeah, it's the Madonna if you want it to be. All right. So Set tries to kill Horus. Uh, and so, again, see if this sounds familiar. She hides him in a thicket of papyrus in the Nile Delta. The sun is threatened. And so he's hidden in the bulrushes of the Nile, maybe? Um, his glyph, uh, his hieroglyph in Egyptian means turmoil, confusion, illness, storm, and rage. 
um, that's set. The place is called Akhbidi, meaning the papyrus thicket of Lower Egypt. All right, I'm not going to get into all this here, but there's this wonderful section of the myth where Isis travels the wide world with her son Horus because she's threatened. Again, does this sound familiar? That there's an edict against this mother and her child, and so she has to flee? Um, she moves among ordinary humans. I love this part of the story. They're not aware of her identity as Isis, the great goddess, the great mother. And she even has to appeal to ordinary mortals for help. Um, gods and humans are normally separate, but not Isis. She will seek help from humans. She will endanger herself for the life of her son. Um, sometimes the other deities protect her, but again, they suck because they're afraid to help her too much because the other deities might get angry at them. Uh, there's the story of Isis and the seven scorpions, you may have heard. Um, seven minor scorpion deities travel with her, minor scorpion deities, and guard Isis as she seeks help for Horus. There's a wealthy woman who has refused to help Isis, and so uh, the scorpions sting the woman's son, making it necessary for what, what do you think happens? The Isis heals her son, right? So the divine aid comes to Isis. The scorpions sting the son, and Isis heals the son. Again, sounds so familiar. I don't know. Um, they take, uh, right, so... Right, this is where Isis, the magician, kind of comes in, because she has to perform some magic to save her son, Horus. Um, often the child god has been bitten by a snake, and um, some texts tex indicate that these creatures are agents of Set. Um, but Isis has magic, and she uses it and keeps her only son alive. Um, and then there's a whole series of texts just about this magic. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, you should know there's a whole section of the myth called the Contendings of Horus and Set. And this is basically the battle between the two brothers, uh, or the, between the two, Set and Horus, um, where Horus challenges Set for the throne. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, the Aeneid, the nine gods mediate. Uh, they have these long, drawn-out contests um, Horus wins through divine aid, but Ra, the sun god, aids Seth. Uh, there's one point, again, where Isis uh, is trying to help her son Horus, and something happens, and he's, he doesn't, either he doesn't know who she is, or he resents her intrusion, and he cuts off her head. And so um, Tote replaces the other god, uh, goddess replaces her head with that of a cow. So if you see Isis with a cow head, that's why, because she lost her head. Her son Horus cut it off. Maybe by accident, maybe not. Now here's where it gets interesting and sexual. Um, there's a scene in, where, where, in which uh, Set sexually molests Horus. There's actually some interesting art <laughs> about this, as you might guess. Um, this is about degradation, but it's also about homosexual desire. In keeping of one, with one of Set's major characteristics, it's about power, right? and power through sexuality. Um, the sexual encounter begins when Set, this is really interesting because I want you to listen, we're trading in the currency of symbols here. Um, Set asks to have sex with Horus who agrees on the condition that Set will give Horus some of his strength. The encounter puts Horus in danger, of course, because in Egyptian tradition, semen is a potent force, dangerous substance. It's akin to poison. And according to some texts, Set's semen enters Horus's body. Um, and that makes him ill. 
Horus eventually, however, thwarts Set by catching Set's semen. There's a lot of semen flying back and forth. Here. <laughs> by catching Set's semen in his hands, Isis retaliates. Again, I'm not making this up. It's right here. Isis retaliates by putting Horus's semen on lettuce leaves that Set eats. Set's defeat becomes apparent when this semen appears on his forehead as a golden disc, as happens all the time. <laughs> he has been impregnated, so this is really the meaning. He's been impregnated with his rival's seed, and as, as a result, he gives birth to this disc. Right? So these, these are images, they're symbols, they sound silly to us, but they're also very real to them. Uh, in contendings, Tote takes the disc and places it on his own head. There are other variations here. That's, um, <laughs> I don't know how much to go into here. There's so much awesome, weird stuff. Um, there's another scene where Horus injures or steals Set's testicles, uh, and Set damages or tears out one or occasionally both of Horus's eyes. Testicles, eyes, right? Uh, resonance, right? Connection, uh, symbolic resonance. All right. There is resolution. There has to be resolution. If there's a story without resolution, it's not a story. It's not finished, right? There has to be this resolution. Uh, Horus and Set, in most of the stories, Horus and Set divide Egypt. Horus is associated with the Nile and the sky and Upper Egypt, set with the desert, the earth, and Lower Egypt. Or in some cases, Horus just wins the whole kingdom. Um, so that's the basic story in Egypt. Now, let's see what happens when it moves to Greece. So you remember these kingdoms are rising and falling, and Egypt falls to Greece, and Greece falls to Rome, and then Persia. Um, what happens to a story when that happens? When the culture changes, what happens to a story? Well, here's what happened in Greece. Um, we have a different story. We have an addition to the story. And this is from the Greek writer Plutarch. But Plutarch was writing during the Roman Empire, but I put him in Greece because he's Greek. So here's that story. Then you may know this one. Set has an elaborate chest. Uh, made to fit Osiris's exact, this is how he gets rid of Osiris, to fit his exact measurements. And then at a banquet, he declares that he will give this beautiful chest as a gift to the person it fits. Stop laughing. <laughs> you laugh out of recognition, meaning you know your mythology. The guests, in turn, lie in the coffin, but none of them fit except Osiris. When Osiris lies down in this chest, it becomes a coffin. Set closes it, slam, seals it, and throws it into the Nile. Um, with Osiris's corpse inside, the chest floats out to sea, arriving in a city called Byblos, Byblos uh, where, the, where a tree grows around. I love this part of the story. So the, this coffin basically lands in Byblos. There's a reason it's Biblos, but we can get into that later. And then it just sits there, and then this tree goes around it, grows around it. So there's Osiris. He's dead. He's inside this tree. Um, Isis must remove the chest from the tree in order to get her husband's body. So she takes the chest out of the tree, but she leaves the tree in Biblos, where it becomes an object of worship. And in fact, it becomes the major ISIS cult, or the ISIS um, community. This is not in the Egyptian sources. So Plutarch's being a little, uh, exercising a little creativity here. But that's how a story stays alive, is you must change it. The story must be adapted in order to be adopted. Right? Otherwise, you can't make the story work for you, even though we try and fail spectacularly often. Um, 
Plutarch also says that Set steals and dismembers the corpse after Isis has retrieved it. And then Isis then finds and buries each piece of her husband's body, with the exception of the penis, which she has to reconstruct with magic, because the original penis was eaten by a fish in the Nile. And there, anyway, there, there are prohibitions against wandering into the Nile naked uh, to this day. According to Plutarch, oh, there it is. This is why the Egyptians had a taboo against eating certain fish. Yeah. Um, OK. OK. What happens in Greece is that Isis in the Ptolemaic age becomes assimilated, or we might say adapted and adopted into several prominent Greek goddesses, Demeter, Persephone, Athena, Hera, Artemis, and Aphrodite. Really. And so you've got this rich Greek mythology, and Isis kind of elides them all. We lose all those goddesses because they're absorbed into this Egyptian goddess? Yes, we do. We can talk about why that might be. She's a versatile goddess. That means she can travel. Right? This is analogous to Hinduism in India. Hindu Hinduism is you can believe anything and be a Hindu. And so you can, Hinduism can go anywhere. Oh, you, you want to say that there's one God and you want to worship him? Fine, you're a Hindu. Which God is it? Because we got like 30 million. Uh, this seems to be a truism of religious um, migration. The migra migration of a story and, a cult and the religion that goes along with it is that there must be adaptation in order for there to be adoption. Um, she becomes one of the great goddesses of Egypt. Isis does. Temples emerge in Delphi. Eleusis in Athens. We're going to hear more about Eleusis. And, and why not? Listen to this saying of Isis. I am all that was and is and will be. And my robe, no mortal, is not yet discovered. Well, that's a very interesting goddess there you have. No mortal as yet discovered? Well, that's an invitation to discovery, isn't it? Among other things. There was a temple to Isis in Athens. In Athens, right, of all places. And they just couldn't kill this Isis cult because it was too adaptable, right? Uh, the other Greek goddesses had their faults. They did certain things really well, other things they really did not do well at. But this Isis, she encompassed everything. She was the great mother, the magician, uh, the, the desirable one. She had secrets. She knew magic, and she saved her son. You know? What's not to like? Well, this continues on into Rome, and I'm almost done here. Rome adopts the Isis cult. And when I say cult, I mean that's a technical term in religious studies. Just, that just means the set, set of beliefs and practices around this god or deity. Uh, Cleopatra thought herself Isis. She was rumored to have dressed as Isis when Mark Anthony arrived. Isn't that interesting? And then, of course, if you were here um, last year for my talk, uh, my second Saturday talk, we really know Isis from a book called The Golden Ass, which is a fantastic book by Apuleius, really titled The Metamorphoses, The Transformations. Um, he is an ass. Well, he's, he's an ordinary human, and he starts to get into magic. He sees some magic performed. He's like, hey, I want to do that. And so he gets his lover, who's not really a magician. She just kind of hung around magicians. And so she's like, yeah, I can do this. And he's like, yeah, 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 OK, let's do Make me a bird. And uh, she screws it up, and he becomes an ass. And uh, it is hilarious. It is one of the funniest books I've ever read. So he's, here's this poor ass. He just wanted to be a bird. He just wanted to fly. 
And he wanders around and he's brutalized by robbers and all kinds of people. And, and he has this great line that I just love. Because he'll, he'll be beaten half to death and then he'll recover and then, you know, he'll, he'll look around and there's nobody trying to kill him and he'll, he'll be like, okay, maybe I'm going to be okay. And that ends the chapter and then the next chapter starts, but fortune had other plans for me. <laughs> and then here we go into this nightmare of being beaten and sodomized and all that other stuff. So it's, a, it's an early heroic novel, picaresque novel. But the point of Apuleius and the Golden Ass is how it ends. And it ends because the, way, the only way for him to lose the effects of this spell is for him to eat roses, which are a symbol of Isis. And he stumbles upon, he doesn't mean to, which is, I love this part, he doesn't mean to. Uh, he stumbles upon this group, and they happen to be acolytes of the goddess Isis, and they have some roses, so he eats them, and suddenly he's transformed. And the end of the story is that he becomes a priest of Isis. That's how not to be an ass, right? Um, so by this time, when the story goes into Rome, it merges with the mystery religions. Uh, coming out of Eleusinus especially, but you may know about these. These are very secretive religions. Now, keep in mind, Rome was, Rome was a lot like us today. <laughs> it's like you can pretty much believe anything and do anything. Uh, we're not going to stop you unless it gets too weird. And you know what got too weird for the Romans? Christianity. Because who were these people eat, uh, eating flesh and drinking blood in secret? That's too much. That's over the line. But if you want to cut a bull open and let the blood fall on your head, that we're good with that. Yeah. Uh, and that's what, that was one of the mystery uh, cults, was you had to be initiated. They would dig out a pit. They would slaughter a bull over your head, and you'd be drenched in blood. Right? And then you were an initiate. And so the worship of Isis becomes about more. It shifts to the magical parts, the initiate parts, like the ritual parts. I mean, obviously, you can't reenact the story of Isis on the Nile, but you can, react, re, you can enact a ritual in which you become a follower of Isis. And so, and, and by definition, you've got to keep that secret. Else everybody's going to be doing it. You cannot post this on Instagram, Pam, because then everybody will be a follower of Isis, and we don't want everybody to be a follower of ISIS, only the select few. That's really the first time we get this notion of the secret teachings of all ages, right? Uh, to quote our founder uh, and the masonry, Freemason. All right, so here's a uh, scholar who had an interesting observation I thought I'd share with you. Women, perhaps, were even more attracted to join the cult of Isis than men of the lower class were for nearly the same reason, to gain control over their lives, to establish a personal connection to the goddess, to lessen the confusion of status inconsistency, right? Where you're supposed to, women, you might know about this. You're supposed to be worshipped and honored and, you know, revered, but... The behavior we exhibit toward you, maybe does, that's status inconsistency. That's what they mean by that. To have an active role in their own religion. All right, so you've probably seen this. Uh, Isis and Horus, Mary and Jesus. Do not search for this on the internet. Okay. Because... <laughs> Because it's the internet and nobody knows what they're talking about. But you do now. Because you understand the nature of myth and story and how it travels. Right? And so you know that you don't have to say that Christianity stole this from Egypt. You don't have to say that. And you don't have to say that, no, Christianity was so different from Egypt that it's not even comparable. You don't even have to go there. Right? Because we're... We're trading in the realm of symbol, in the currency of symbol. And that's a powerful symbol. 
it's no wonder it appears all over, right? A mother and a child? What's more fundamental than that? So we don't have to get crazy about this, right? And so you don't have to say that Christianity is an unoriginal religion. It is. But you don't have to say that Christianity was not influenced by Egypt either, because it was. All right. ISIS continues into the Middle Ages and after through this esoteric mysticism, Freemasonry, the Hermetic Corpus. Um, and this, this is interesting because as a story travels, um, it's like a ship in the ocean. Things start sticking to it, you know, and you can kind of see where it's been. And so one of the things that gets connected with ISIS is the statement by Heraclitus that nature loves to hide. Nature loves to hide. Um, isn't that interesting? And so you get this, these figures of Isis coming out of her veil, right? And Isis becomes an emblem of science because that's what science, remember that phrase I read earlier about, you know, you don't know who I am, but maybe you could? That's perfect, a perfect metaphor for science, right? Find out about the world you're in, because the secrets of this world are hidden, but we can find them out. And so science and esoterica, yeah, they're, they're similar structurally. And look at that statue. They're fantastic. And so our old friend Helena Blavatsky in the late 19th century writes a work called Isis Unveiled. And so this is the late 19th century. And she continues because she has adapted enough to be adopted by various peoples in the United States now. Manly P. Hall, of course, the secret teachings of all ages. They're secret because they belong to ISIS. And you can trace that right back to the ISIS cult. Uh, whether it's in Egypt, because remember she was a magician there, or Rome, or the Middle Ages with the Masons this wonderful sign of the rending of the veil, the openness of wisdom to the world, which is not out there on a website. It must be earned. It must be sought, and it must be earned, and you must go through an initiation in order to achieve it. What about ISIS today? What would you do if you considered yourself a daughter of ISIS? I don't mean some romantic notion, although that's fine. I mean if you really wanted to live the ISIS story in 2018, you would be Nawal El Sadawi, Egyptian feminist writer, activist, physician, psychiatrist, author. Her autobiography is called The Daughter of ISIS. She does not mean that as affectation. She means that as reality. She is ISIS today, or a devotee of ISIS today. What does she do? She's been called the Simone de Beauvoir of the Arabic world. Here's what she does. She's the founder and president of the Arab Women's Solidarity Association and co-founder of the Arab Association for Human Rights. She's been awarded honorary degrees on three continents. In 2004, she won the North-South Prize from the Council of Europe. She won a whole bunch of other prizes. Um, she's held the positions of author for the Supreme Council for Arts and Social Sciences in Cairo. She's the Director General of the, Director General of the Health Education Department and the Ministry of Health in Cairo. She's the Secretary General of the Medical Association in Cairo. She's a doctor and a novelist. And she wrote this amazing book that I taught years ago called Woman at Point Zero. She, in 1972, she was removed from her position as the Director of Health Education after the publication of a book called Women and Sex. She began research on neurosis in Egyptian women, during which she met a doctor at a prison who talked about the inmates, including a female prisoner who had killed a man and had been sentenced to hanging. Sadawi was interested in meeting the woman and visiting the prison, and her colleague arranged for her to conduct this research. 
She visited many women in the cell block and in the mental clinic and was able to conduct 21 in-depth case studies for her 1976 publication, Women in Neurosis in Egypt. But this woman, this one woman at point zero, remained a woman apart, she says. She was executed in 1974, but she left a lasting impact on Nawal El Sadawi, who said she could not rest until she'd written about this woman's story and finished the novel in one week. Sadawi describes this woman at point zero as a martyr and says she admires her because, quote, few people are ready to face death for a principle. Who's that sound like? Later, when Sadawi was imprisoned in 1981 for political offenses, she reflected that she would find herself looking for this woman at point zero among the prison population, unable to believe that a woman that, who, had, who had inspired her so much was truly dead. Who is Isis? She's the ideal queen. She's the ideal wife, mother, magician. And here is a prayer to her that we will end with. Mighty mother, daughter of the Nile, we rejoice as you join us with the rays of the sun. Sacred sister, mother of magic, we honor you. Lover of Osiris, she who is mother of the universe itself. Isis, who was and is and ever shall be, daughter of the earth and sky, I honor you and sing your praises. Glorious goddess of magic and light, I open my heart to your mystery.